people should know how to protect themselves, how to protect their data, how to protect their offices, premises, homes, how to act in the case of the emergency, how to... The network should be stronger there, stronger in terms not just education, but also of alerting to the danger. Hello and welcome to The Human Rights Defender, a podcast series in which we'll explore the work and lives of brave individuals standing up for our human rights. My name's Philip Merrill. I'm a communications officer at Civil Rights Defenders, an international human rights organization. And in this opening season, we'll be taking a closer look at the Western Balkans and Turkey, regions in which democracy and the rule of law have come under growing strain in recent years. Rounding off season one, we'll be speaking to a human rights defender whose story encapsulates, in many ways brings to life, so much of what we've spoken about in previous episodes. Come to think of it, why wouldn't it? With the exception of Albania and Turkey, each of the countries we've covered here used to share the same state just 30 years ago, the former Yugoslavia of course. They share the same elites, political culture, and crucially for HRDs, the same security apparatus. Sure, experiences differ from country to country, and our guest today, Sajjan Sushnitsa, will go into more depth about the Republic of Srpska entity of Bosnia-Herzegovina, but it's essentially these elites which have incited divisions among communities, deployed sophisticated disinformation campaigns and populist narratives, often outright attacking those who dare to speak out, all with the aim of preventing real substantive change from ever taking place in the region. Sajjan, hi, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I didn't want to give away too much in the intro, I guess. You're in the best position to to share your experiences and the sort of challenges you faced when you dared to speak out against the regime in Republika Srpska. But I actually, I wasn't sure how best to introduce you. I know you used to be an auditor back in Banja Luka. You're a law graduate, also a writer and columnist. Why don't you start by telling us why you're a dissident? Why is your voice so dangerous for the Dodik regime? I don't know whether it is a danger or it is just an inconvenience for them. You know, it's. I think that... Every voice, every speaking or advocated truth which could be proven and which could be argumented, every questioning of one society or one political community which goes against the, the dominating and prevailing narratives of the majority is dangerous for the society and for the regime. In my case, I can point out uh, several facts, several things. One is that in my works, in my uh, public uh, appearances and publication, I criticize the political community of Republika Srpska, this entity of Republika Srpska as political community which was created solely on genocide and war crimes of ethnic extermination. Also, another thing why my voice is maybe inconvenient for the regime in Republika Srpska, but also in Belgrade, because I'm also advocating this uh, historic and legal and uh, judiciary truth about the origins of the conflict in Bosnia and in ex-Yugoslavia, which are not based in the, the eternal hatred like this dominant myth or the clash of civilization and those kind of the nonsense. It is purely the interests of the political elite in Belgrade and in Zagreb as well to propone the conflicts among the ethnic groups in Bosnia so they could gain something in their own states, in their own internal political systems and scenery, and also to gain in the regional aspects of this crisis. And these uh, historic facts and uh, judicial facts of the Hague Tribunal are so uh, concise, so hard, and proving that, uh, you know, this... uh, desire to extend your own states, to extend your own political space of your nation was one of the major, the crucial initiator of the conflict, of the war conflict. Of course, there is also the aspects of the corruption and criminal operation of these political elites prior and during the war. The warlords, the war profiteers who, who, who strike serious gain out of the war by smuggling, by arm trading, by looting and robbery of the this other who was the target, you know. So there is a, I think that this is very, very important 
part of the story of the Bosnian War. Another thing, when you ask about uh, why my voice is dangerous, is how this history of Republic of Srpska, how it reflects today. When I received the major threats in Banja Luka in 2018, and when I was dislocated from Banja Luka for six months, and in Banja Luka happened the big protest, Justice for David protests, protests who were triggered by the killing of the one young boy and uh, covering up the murder and protecting the criminals who did it. And during the, all these months, a group of the journalists uh, uh, researched and got a very good inside information that they are coming and leaking from the our Republika Srpska police about who were the perpetrators of the murder and who were the covering ups. So you can see the pattern. The criminal organization who was behind the murder of young, young David has the same bosses, the same structure, that it is the same organization that involved in producing distrust and conflict in Banja Luka area in 1991-1992. So the, the same criminal power structure and political power structure who are running Banja Luka, running Republika Srpska now, a big part of this criminal power structure existed and has their roots in the 1990s. And they were responsible then for the intimidation, for the spreading of the fear and the mis- distrust among the ethnic and religious groups, etc., As I understand, uh, you're currently in self-imposed exile. Uh, you had to flee Bosnia-Herzegovina. How does someone reach that decision? What were the steps that led to your understanding that it was time to leave everything behind, take your family and escape? Two sides of this answer. One is this my public engagement, my public writing, my public appearance in which I criticize, as I told you, the ex- uh, criticize the existence of Republika Srpska, because I'm trying to prove and trying to shed a light on this history, on this uh, unjust peace and unjust and illegitimate existence of Republika Srpska as something that is not in the interest of the Bosnian Serb people, if you want. And other side of the pressure and, uh, and threats is is uh, my personal story and this is the story of the boy whose father was murdered on the very beginning of the Bosnian war on April 10th 1992 my father was a police inspector and uh, retired who was working in the police in Banja Luka for 20 so years very known among Banja Luka people in Banja Luka city and he was murdered by the Serbs and the radical paramilitary unit called Serb Defense Forces. The murder was organized by the criminal power structures, or literally those criminal power structures that, that killed young David Dragicevic. After two years, uh, investigation opened for just a small portion of time, and uh, one inspector proved that uh, they, the, 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 who was in, engaged in all this, and he even got their confessions on the paper black and white and they repeated it in front in in this procedure in front of the prosecutor but this never get come to the court you know so after years and years my family and me we, we tried to start this process you know to but the prosecutor officer Rukasovska didn't respond in any way so in 2017 and later in 2018 we addressed this case to the state prosecutor office of Bosnia Herzegovina in Sarajevo and they took the case and we qualified this in our in our private charge criminal charge we qualified that as a war crime and what was the main punchline of this of these allegations that we address to the state prosecutor uh, office uh, for war crimes in Bosnia in Sarajevo is actually what I was writing about. I faced in 2018, I, I faced very, very serious, uh, serious threats. So it is like my personal story, which I never spoke about publicly before. My personal story cumulated with my public work you know, and writing and advocacy that I did. 
And there was uh, first there was uh, several newspaper articles in which they were targeting me as someone who is trying to bring down the regime coalition in cooperation with the foreign organization, foreign governments, and the uh, Republic of Serbia oppositional parties. And depict me as the exponent of the foreign organization and NGOs, and uh, it was clearly uh, one dehumanization of of me, you know, as, as a traitor of someone who is doing against, who is working against interests of the Serb people in Republika Srpska. And uh, very quickly in March 2018, I receive very serious insider information that uh, from inside the Republika Srpska police, which came in. From, from these circles in which uh, the analysis and the information that they got indicating that some kind of the murder or assassination of some regime critics will take place in Banja Luka. And my name and name of the journalist Slobodan Vasković and also the columnist Dragan Bursac and other people came up. But this information was presented to me that I'm most likely the target. So I immediately leave Banja Luka, dislocate myself, and I left out of Banja Luka until election didn't finish. When election did finish, uh, as they did, with total reinforcement of the Republic of Srpskadotic regime, I had to return. I didn't have any means to continue living out of my address without my family and without the job and everything. So I had to leave, come back. And as soon as I came back, I had the great pressure. Police or Fribaka Subska had, I don't know whether they had surveilled me or tracked me, but uh, in one contact with them, which, which was not, which I didn't plan, they approached, they arrested me. And they brought me to the police uh, premises in Banja Luka, which where I have received the threats from 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 at least one, I think police inspector because he the, the person was dressed in civilian clothes. So uh, they kept me for four hours with with no reasons. They charged me for the disrupting the police officer in his duty. And uh, they forced me to sign it, so I did just go out of this situation as quickly as possible, and uh, I did get out. And a uh, week or so after that, I came to the job where I worked, and I was suspended. I found out that the director of this institution, its audit office of Republika Srpska, where I worked as a performance auditor, for 11 years by that time. They start, they initiated the disciplinary procedure against me, not because of my work, not because of my negative, I don't know, because I had some negative marks on my work. I didn't, ha- I didn't have such marks. So they initiated disciplinary procedure because of my public writing. And they suspend me for the job and later they fired me. So I got fired because... I was criticizing the history of Republika Srpska. But in particular, one reason they, in one case, they, they point out one article, and this is the article from the August 2018, just before the election, in one interview with uh, Bojan Tontic from the Remarker Media in Serbia, I concluded that uh, David Dragicevic was killed by the history of Republika Srpska. It's a form of allegory that I use there, but the allegory that that, that was depicting the reality. And uh, I said that the police Republika Srpska is an institution which members accused and sentenced for the long prison sentence because of the war crimes, because of the genocide, because of the ethnic extermination of the non-Serbs in all parts of the Republika Srpska or all parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which Republika Srpska occupied during the war. And now this police of Republika Srpska it was involved in another murder and in another cover-up. So I said, you know, it apparently that in Republika Srpska there is no need to attack Muslims or Bosnian Croats anymore because they are not there or they are not they are not existing anymore or they are so 
unimportant anymore in 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 terms of numbers so the the this regime of republika srpska criminal regime which existed for 20 years now is changing their target they are now targeting unloyal serbs or serbs who disobeyed their main narratives so for listeners that are not so well accustomed to the region can you give a bit of context as to who they are who are they that you feel destroyed your country who are they that continue to hamper any sort of progress towards a more open uh, society you know i was actually speaking with a colleague from a partner organization uh, she's from the uk just recently and i was describing the ways in which the right wing Uh, groups and ultras and football fans and so on how they often utilize the mobilized by structures of the deep state and she looked at me with this quite pale face as if um some conspiracy theorist talking about uh, this deep state structures right but it's not really a conspiracy theory is it how do you understand this phenomenon of these upper echelons of power across the western balkans essentially this is not really exclusive to to bosnia or to serbia for that matter this is across the former yugoslavian space how do you understand these structures and this phenomenon now in bosnia in republika srpska in serbia you have people in parties in uh, social party of serbia in uh, sns vučić uh, sns in dodik party you have the same people who were politicians assembly members of the republika srpska parliament or serbian parliament during the 1990s you have you have people who were officers colonels generals and and uh, high ranking officers in the army or in the security army security service which are now are rebranded into the, some new politicians or new new figures on the political scenes you have also the people from the civil civil security services of the serbia who are now major intellectual or political elite in republika srpska so for example i was targeted by predrag charanić predrag charanić was the former member of the serbian security services who is now the dean of the faculty of security in banja luka and uh, member of the security council for the protection of the constitutional order of republika srpska a form of the umbrella para service secret para service of the milorad dodik in republika srpska in this security council you can find also the names who were major high ranking officers of the serbian security agency back in the 90s like sredo enović and uh, risto zaric so all the persons are are there so what you're saying is that it's not so much deep state as it is actual state of course i i don't see that this talking about deep states maybe you can talk about deep states in the in the democracy in the developed democracy where you have the front line you know politicians and party and behind them you have this bureaucracy and security army and the army industry which are pulling strings more or less you know. but here everything is pretty much visible you know so i will not call them deep states they are old party security apparatchiks to use by this wonderful russian world apparatchik to depict them and they are there so when the party in power wants to discuss the human resources to put the people in fun- on on the top position in ministries in some public institution in police everyone goes to this uh, filter which are formed by this old apparatchiks and nobody new can come nobody who they don't trust can come and be part of this important institution you know like police or judiciary or so ministries as well so so it is like this power structure are reproducing themselves so narrative is one thing and this personal personal line is another thing I think that they are not researched enough. There is people who are researching and and studying this, but I don't I, I think that in this post Yugoslav states this this is not visible enough. And the third line that consists of this is this army 
of followers of this apparatchiks and on, and on this narratives so the army of followers does not have to be just the ultras or the you know football fan club members or it is army of the people who are just indoctrinated with this nationalistic narratives and they are or they have a big privileges and favors because of they are the belonging to this party line they are belonging they are close to these apparatchiks or they are close to the these circles of power they are in some tent circle from the center but never mind they are connected with the leader and they are connected with the party so the threats mainly begin with these followers by the followers who are doing this not by the order they are doing this uh, on their own how does one overcome this personally being branded as traitor or enemy of the state by the highest political structures by mass media by parts of society essentially um, not being welcome in your hometown how does someone deal with this psychologically and where do you find the motivation to keep going and to keep uh, speaking your word when i look at my hometown as beneluka what happened to me as someone who has a different opinion or advocate uh, alternative uh, and and criticism toward a regime and uh, on all this concept of republika srpska it is nothing what happened with my neighbors in 1992 my hometown dissolved in front of my eyes during the 1990s between 1992 and 1995 this is the first shock that i and many many people whether they have serbs or non serbs who remain to live in in the city during and after the war This is the main feeling that we have. 75,000 people were expelled in three and a half years from the Banyaluka city. In that process of the terror campaigns against non-Serbs, more than 250 people were murdered, civilians. Even in, Bo- in Bosnia, this is Banyaluka is very dark place uh, regarding this knowledge about these war times there, let alone on a regional level. But during this war years in 1990s entire society collapsed my vision of banyaluka as my hometown collapsed it is it is the great disappointment not because the murder of my father i didn't just lost my father i lost my friends i lost my community you know how many 15 16 years old young people spend their time with their parents they are spending time with their friends with their i lost that over the night i lost half of my classmates in gimnasia in high school in banyaluka in 4 5 months so everything was collapsing and after the war we tried to say okay this is now some we will rebuild it okay things change you know people are coming back and in those day people from since 1999 2000 a lot of banyaluka non serbs return just to return their property back and less of them stayed but they was they were there they were staying and we hope that in these few years after 1999 processes will go in a better direction in terms of you know diversifying city accepting the returnees as as their our friends are our, our, our hometown as a people who, who who to whom Banja Luka belongs as same as to to everybody else but it didn't happen when Dodi came to power in 2006 and a lot of people had a doubt that any kind of the constructing normal society in Banja Luka will be possible the new generation that, that comes that was born in the after 1985 after 1990 those generation now became much and much radicalized during the last 10 years of republika srpska so my society my perception of banyaluka is like like two waves of radicalization one was during the war just before and during the war and this little glance of hope after the war and then again you have this another wave of radicalization that lasts more than 10 years it is without the war but it is still a very severe conflict it's ideological it's rhetorical it's political and it is it is more and more hybrid conflict you have a lot of intelligence you have a lot of the fake news campaign disinformation campaign you have a lot of cyber attacks a lot of espionage a lot of the undermining of the bosnian state institution and a lot of the separatisms and a lot of this radical fundamental uh, clerical and and religious fundamentalism when i think of what is banyaluka f- 
to me and for me it's my hometown which I lost and then I foolishly thought that I can regain it somehow and I, I don't think so anyone from my generation or plus minus five ten years couldn't do that not even virtually so when these pressures in 2008 piled up when I got fired and uh, suspended the job and I didn't receive that as big blow from my hometown or from my community because I already learned to see that in this community I have friends, I have, I have no people that think differently and I, there, there are others. So those friends are still my friends, those other are still the other and I, I just uh, had this bitter taste of losing of root. Where do we go from here? When you look at younger generations across the region, do you see any signs of hope? Any signs that could inspire change five, ten years down the line? Activists, the NGOs, the activist groups, they have very big trouble to cope with, to fight with the regime, to fight the structure, which it's like a perpetuum mobile. It's like always reproducing itself and there is no hole through which you can crack the system you don't have possibility to have your own political representatives there if you go to the elections from let's say if NGO wants to go to the political level and this or some movement of citizens or some activist group want to go to the political level if they go with this liberal citizens, civil society, human rights, uh, civil liberty story, they will not succeed to gain enough votes in the structure which only recognize narratives which are Serb, Croat or Bosniak narrative. It's a great problem. On top of this, you have the growing autocracy. All this power structure remain live without no, without without illustration, without uh, denazification after the war. And you have this growing autocracy from growing uh, enrichment of this power structure. They are now governing, for example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Rapalka Srpska regime is governing, Dodik regimes is now in continuous power since 2006, so 14 years. They're for 14 years, they're exploiting public budget, they're exploiting public goods, public money through the corruptive businesses, to the corruptive uh, public vacancies, to the corruptive public works, you know, and uh, they are growing big. They are growing enormous. In small Republic of Sotko, we have more than 20 millionaires. Sorry to interrupt. And I understand, I totally understand why this picture seems entirely bleak for you. But again, for listeners that may not be following the situation in the Western Balkans uh, so closely, we're talking about ethnic cleansing. We're talking about hybrid warfare. There's a whole different conversation here as well, though, isn't there? There's a story about EU accession, uh, opening and closing of chapters, progress reports, youth intercultural exchanges, seminars and roundtables about the rule of law and democracy. There's a whole different discussion taking place. And so my question is, within that discussion, is there anything that we can do? Do we hold any of the levers of power within our own hands? And is there anything that we can do to reform this destiny? Okay, I was getting to this part because on top of these autocratic regimes which are growing on, uh, becoming more hardliner and hardliner, you have this Rus Russian influence which are now keeping all this, what I told you, this Dayton post-war structure, this criminal, corruptive governments and politician and party apparatchiks that goes back a long time. This auto new autocracy that was developed in just in the last six years, uh, five to six years, Russians were now keeping all this together in one key, in one key position, which do not allow normalization, internal political normalization within the countries and between the countries and between the people. They don't allow the normalization. They don't allow the liberalization. They don't allow the rule of law. And all these things that you are now told, you know, the accession process toward you, the chapters opening, closing, this could be, be, be the part of the story for Montenegro, maybe partially, for, and for Albania. 
but we are talking about two communities that didn't uh, directly experience the war. Montenegro was partially involved in the on the beginning nineteen nineties in the in the campaign, but soon the political elite of the Montenegro liberated itself from the hug of the Milosevic regime. But what we can do, I think that with, with all these contextual uh, circumstances with growing Russian aggressiveness in, in Balkan and with all this instability around the Balkan, look at the eastern, eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, look at the North Africa, look at the Ukraine, with all this growing instability just beside the Western Balkan region, I think that human rights activists, civil liberty, civil society activists, they should maybe change approach toward greater international advocacy and lobbying in the center of the Western world, you know, in Europe, in America, and trying to bring the attention of the actors in the, to the Balkan. I think that they should be more involved in this connecting and explaining what is going on, crucially what is going on, not from the perspective of some bristle bu- bureaucrat or from the perspective of the embassy, but crucially what is going on from on, on terrain, on, on, as I told you. What I'm telling you, it's nothing that... It is just my opinion. It, it is something that a lot of the human rights activists from Banyaluka will tell you. Not in the same way, but it, it, the, all the, the problems are there. So this is, this is the first thing that human rights activists must do. They must cooperate, they must network through the Western Balkan region and form some kind of the lobby polls, advocacy polls outside, just to diverge the attention toward Balkan more and more and to be very aggressive about it. Second thing that it's very important with this growing autocracy and with this Russian aggressiveness that will not stop that easily is security. The human rights activists and this community and NGOs and and all the funds, they have to work on the security culture and security education of the human rights activists and the groups. They people should know how to protect themselves how to protect their data, how to protect their offices, premises, homes, how to act in the case of the emergency, how to... The network should be stronger there, stronger in terms not just education, but also of alerting to the danger and providing the escape routes and providing the real uh, uh, reallocations, etc. So this community feel that it can do a lot of things and it can find a safe way out of it. You know, in, if if it's necessary, so they could survive. And this is the great. The third things that maybe people should do is to be more oriented to the political party. It's very, it's very wrong that NGO sector says we are neutral. What? Who is neutral? Neutrality does not exist in politics. It is artificial and very temporary. It's like evading a problem. So a lot of NGOs say we are not political party. We are very careful with political party, but it's very it's very important to for the NGO and human rights activists to have this liaison with the parties. They don't have to act together or to be one organization or to be one moment. No, but they have to use these parties, especially if they are members of the local assemblies or the or the parliament. They use these to send the message, to, pr- to promote their message, to, uh, to, to lobby for certain things, you know. Of course, there is some area between NGOs and political parties which, which can be said it is, a, it is a lobby. It is a lobby group or something else. But I think that some kind of the form of this activity should be much more engaged. And this should go across the nation. So there is a, a very little cooperation between parties from... Tirana, Belgrade, Sarajevo, Pristina, Polgorica, etc., etc. And I think that NGOs can could be these, and especially the civil rights and, and uh, human rights activists can and groups can be these channels for networking these, let's say, progressive parties, let's say parties who are anyway promoting the uh, ideas of the liberal and uh, left liberal politics and society. So I think that there is there could be a lot of things that could be done, 
structurally, you know, and uh, especially to do that, I think that NGOs must present a good and proper, let's say not good, but proper picture about this reality to the funds, to the organization which are funding all this, which are funding the NGOs, which are funding projects and said, you know, listen, this is what we need here. Okay, we can do something around secession, around the session process, chapter this, chapter that. But listen, this is where the social problem is. This is where the tension is. This is where the, where the big, big problem are. So, for example, in Banyaluka, there is not single project of NGO which are funding to help returnees reestablish themselves in political and social space of Banyaluka. There is not one single project of that, for example. Especially there is no project of networking between NGO and human rights activists with, with political parties, etc., etc. So I think that maybe these things that I said maybe could put uh, human rights activists and general liberal society, civil society in the better position. Thank you, Sujan. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and this truly insightful and touching perspective on developments in your home country. Uh, with this, we've rounded up season one of the Human Rights Defenders podcast. Uh, do stay tuned. We'll be back very shortly with new features and new topics. Speak to guests not only from the Western Balkans, but more globally as well. Thank you so much. Speak again soon. Bye-bye.